Hi, it's Mr. Ramage, and this video lesson is going to get us from the Articles of Confederation to the brand new United States Constitution as we look at the transition from one form of government to another. So we've reviewed the Articles of Confederation and looked at the different characteristics of this government, the first government of the United States of America, and we've identified some of the problems with the Articles. We're not going to review all the characteristics of the Articles here. We've already done that. But we need to know that this limited government, this limited power has made the country uh, susceptible to some problems. Without a strong central government, the country is going to have a hard time getting things going. And that's vitally important in these first few years of a brand new nation. Coming out of the American Revolution and its relationship with England, the new United States wanted to make sure that the central or federal government of the United States was weak and therefore ineffective. They didn't purposely want to make it ineffective, but they did purposely want to make it weak. They didn't want to revisit a relationship with their government that they experienced with England, feeling that the government was too oppressive. Most of the initial problems under the Articles of Confederation were economic problems. So economic issues were threatening to ruin the nation. Remember, the Articles of Confederation did not give the government the power to collect taxes or to regulate commerce or trade. The United States is deeply in debt from the American Revolution and can't afford to pay off its debts to other nations. That eventually would lead to some problems down the road if they were unable to do that. But one of the major events that triggered the need for a revision of the Articles of Confederation was Shays' Rebellion. We're not gonna go into a lot of detail on Shays' Rebellion, but it was an incident that showed people in power that the Articles needed to be revised. So a convention was called to amend the Articles of Confederation, and that's important to understand. The initial plan was not to completely scrap the Articles and write a brand new constitution, but rather to go and amend those uh, problems with the Articles and make some changes that would make it more efficient and more effective. So in May of 1787, in Philadelphia, the Constitutional Convention was called together and 55 delegates from 12 states arrived. Over the course of the first few days, they decide that, yes, we do need to scrap the Articles of Confederation and create an entirely new form of government. And by September of 1787, a new constitution is written, which will then have to go before the states for ratification and approval. And again, we're not going to go into detail of the convention. We're simply going to look ahead to what are the characteristics of this new government. As we examine our state standard, we need to know that um, the U.S. Constitution established the foundations of the American nation and the relationship between the people and their government. And that is the big theme of our first unit on these founding documents. How did each of these documents create the foundation for the country that's lasted ever since the 1780s? And what is the relationship that it creates between the people and their government? So keep that in mind as we go through the remainder of this lesson. So what are the features of the Constitution? Again, we're not going to go through this in a ton of detail. We're going to look at some basics and explore them more in detail later on. So the Constitution creates a federal system of government. Federalism is taking the power of the government and dividing it at different levels. So out of the Constitution, we see a federal system that has a national or federal government, a state government, and then, of course, your local government. So the power of the government is divided amongst these levels of governments. That's our federal system. And as we talk about the branches here in a minute, remember that all branches exist at all levels. So there is a federal executive, a state, and a local executive. Amongst these levels, there are certain powers that some have and some don't. But for the most part, all three levels share similar powers and responsibilities. So a federal system of government is created in the United States Constitution. Speaking of the branches, we have three branches of government. Now remember, under the Articles of Confederation, there was only one branch of government, which was the legislative branch. But now under the Constitution, we are gonna see the inclusion of two additional branches, the executive branch and the judicial branch. And this gives us three functioning branches that all perform certain tasks and responsibilities. The executive branch will enforce the laws, the legislative will create and make the laws, and the judicial branch will interpret those laws. Within these three branches, we're also gonna have a series of checks and balances. 
So the legislative branch can pass laws and legislation, but in order for that to go into effect, it must be signed by the president. If those laws are deemed to be unconstitutional, the Supreme Court can override those laws and they are no longer valid. So all three branches function together separately and all have checks on each other. We're not going to go into detail on all those checks and balances, but again, we're just exploring the foundations and the basics of this form of government. So three branches of government are created to help the government work much more effectively than it did under the Articles of Confederation. Let's focus a little bit more on the legislative branch because there are some significant changes between what was happening under the Articles and now what's going to be happening under the Constitution. Under the Articles of Confederation, there was a unicameral Congress, a one-house Congress, where each state essentially had one vote, no matter the size or population of that state. This is a change that's going to be made under the Constitution as we create a bicameral Congress made up of two houses. One house designated the Senate and one the House of Representatives. For the Senate, we're going to see equal representation of two senators per state. And then the House of Representation will be based on the state's population, larger states with larger populations, sending more representatives to Congress. Members of the House will be elected to two-year terms, while members of the Senate will be elected to six-year terms. So there is definitely a, a difference there. The Senate is seen as the upper house of Congress um, and has certain responsibilities and powers, and the House has others, but they must work together to pass legislation. The other thing that the U.S. Constitution makes sure to reinforce is that the United States uses a Republican form of government, and that through representative democracy, people vote for their representatives to both the state's local, and federal levels of government. So representative democracy becomes a key component and one of the foundational parts of the U.S. Constitution, giving the voters the power and authority to vote for those representatives to go to their state capital or to the national capital and represent them. So we have some significant differences that we've already identified between the Articles and the Constitution. Let's look at those one more time. So under the Articles of Confederation, we're going to see a weak federal government. Under the Constitution, the powers of the federal government are going to increase significantly and create a much stronger federal government. Under the Articles of Confederation, there was an emphasis on strong state governments. Well, under the Constitution, we are going to reduce the state powers a little bit more than maybe some people wanted it to be. So we're going to weaken the state's powers just a little bit. Under the Articles, we're going to see one branch of government, which was just the legislative branch. Now, under the Constitution, we're going to see three branches of government, the executive, legislative, and judicial branch. In that legislative branch under the Articles, there was a unicameral Congress. Now we're going to have a bicameral Congress uh, with two houses. Underneath the Articles of Confederation, they did not have the power to tax. We are going to give the new government under the Constitution the power to tax. And also under the Articles, the national government did not have the power to regulate trade. That is something that's going to be given to the national government under the Constitution. So there are some significant differences between these two governments. And going from a weak national government to a strong national government is going to make some people a bit concerned about increasing the power and authority of this national government. That's a debate we're going to have in a little bit when we discuss the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists. But within the writing in the Constitution, we do need to talk about a couple of key compromises that were made. So during the debate about representation, there was a big question about, well, how many representatives will each state have in this new Congress that we are writing? Under the Articles, each state had one vote, and that plan wasn't exactly the best of plans. So James Madison from the state of Virginia put forth what's known as the Virginia Plan, which said that representation in this Congress should be based on population. This makes sense because Virginia was a relatively large state with a relatively large population. The larger the population, the more representatives, the more representatives, the more votes, therefore the more power and influence in the government. Smaller states like New Jersey with a smaller population wanted to have equal representation in this new Congress with each state basically having the same powers uh, as every other state with one vote, similar to what was done under the Articles of Confederation. The debate went on and on about this until finally Roger Sherman from Connecticut put forth what's called the Connecticut Plan, a compromise between the two ideas. This is where we get our bicameral legislature, incorporating both plans into a bicameral Congress. One 
House with equal representation, which would satisfy the supporters of the New Jersey plan, and one House based on population, which would satisfy the supporters of the Virginia plan. So that's what we have now, two House Congress with one House equal representation in the U.S. Senate and the other based on population in the U.S. House of Representatives. Well, now that we've settled that issue in terms of population, the next question became, well, who do we count towards a state's population? Because there is a significant slave population in the United States. And the question became, uh, do we count them or do we not count them? Northern states did not want the slave population counted because that would increase the voting power of southern states. Northern states were not exactly anti-slavery, but they were anti-giving the South more voting power. Southern states, of course, wanted to count the slave population because, just like we said, that would increase their voting power in the new government. So the debate went on and on and on about this until finally Charles Pickney from South Carolina proposed what's known as the three-fifths compromise. And the compromise was that we would take three-fifths of the entire state's slave population and count those people. So it's not three-fifths of a person, it's three-fifths of the entire population, and that would be added to the state's overall population thereby determining how many representatives they're going to have in Congress. Slavery became another topic as we discuss uh, issues in this new government and under this new constitution moving forward, as northern states wanted to end the slave trade and reduce the importation of slaves from overseas. Of course, the South, with slavery as a vital part of their economy, wants to continue the slave trade and continue to import slaves into the country. Eventually, the slave trade compromise was reached, where the slave trade would be ended after a period of 20 years. But in return for the South agreeing to this slave trade compromise, they wanted the North support for enforcing a fugitive slave law, so that if slaves did escape and go to a non-slave state, that those slaves could be returned to their owners, they would not be freed simply by leaving the state or going into a state where there wasn't slavery, and that those slaves would be returned as property to their owners. These are some pretty significant compromises which happened in order to make this constitution a reality. So what are some key takeaways from this lesson? What do we need to know moving forward? Number one, the Constitution addressed a number of weaknesses in the Articles of Confederation. There were problems that had to be solved, and the Constitution is going to address those. Not everyone's going to be happy about it, but that's what we're going to talk about next. The Constitution created a federal form of government, dividing the power of government at the national, state, and local level. It created three branches of government at each of those levels, the legislative, executive, and judicial branches, as well as a bicameral Congress based on equal representation and population. The new constitution guaranteed a republican form of government where people vote and elect representatives to speak on their behalf, and that there was a series of compromises during the debates over the creation of the constitution, which had to be reached in order to get the constitution approved. There was a compromise over the two houses of Congress versus the um, single unicameral house under the articles. We have the three-fifths compromise, which was a compromise over who would be counted in that state's population, and the slave trade compromise, ending the slave trade 20 years down the road and uh, in exchange for support of a fugitive slave law. So that's a look at our transition from the Articles of Confederation to the Constitution, some of the significant differences between them, and the new constitution's relation to the people and how it laid the foundations for a new government in our country.